Hello, everyone. I hope our discussions and sessions happening today are adding value to your learning experience. And we are back with yet another invigorating panel discussion on the topic, reinventing employee experience in the new era of work. With the increased adoption of digital tools and a rapid organizational shift to remote and hybrid working models, COVID-19 has amplified the focus on employee experience. These recent demographic shifts have made it imperative for organizations to focus more on fostering a culture of employee well-being and development. They have to put up a digital lens to the HR functions to redefine and enhance employee experience. There's a robust connection between consumer experience, employee experience, and revenue. Businesses now must provide a more empathetic and positive experience to their employees to increase their productivity and also the company revenue. And there's a need to digitally transform HR processes with cloud, analytics, automation, and artificial intelligence for an enhanced employee experience. In today's panel discussion, we will discuss how employee experience has become the focal point of how organizations prepare themselves for the future of work and why there is an increased need to create that ideal experience in this hybrid work model that we are experiencing now. And it is with great pleasure that I invite and introduce our esteemed panel speakers for this session. First up, we have Norlida Azmi, Group CPO at Axiata Malaysia. Norlida is driving the group's people strategy in line with Axiata's vision to become the next generation of digital champions. She also serves as a non-independent, non-executive director, nominee of Axiata Group Berhad on e.co group. Our next speaker on the panel is Carmen V, board member, CHRO Global Transformation Expert at HTX, which is Home Team Science and Technology Agency, Singapore. Carmen is a global C-suite HR leader with over 25 years of international business experience, driving large-scale business transformation and change management within fast-growing companies with multiple complex mergers and acquisitions. She has a proven ability with the creation of new HR transformation roadmaps, operating models, and redefining skills and competencies for corporate agility. She has executed multiple progressive HR practices and has aligned HR strategies to the business objectives. Kramin is also the driving, is driving the digital HR transformation at the national level with IHRP and is contributing to the national HR certification movement and shaping the industry, leading to the confirmment of pioneer master level certification by the Singapore government. Uh, presently, she is board member of HTX and the Ministry of Home Affairs, Republic Polytechnic School of Management and the IHRP Digital and Tech Committee. Next up, we have Adrian Tan, Strategist, Future of Work at the Institute for Human Resource Professionals, Singapore. Adrian is the Strategist, Future of Work at IHRP to better prepare Singapore companies for what is to come on the future of work through thought leadership and be the voice of leading topics and mega trends in human capital development. He was a serial entrepreneur in the recruitment, career search, and HR consultancy space, leading to two HR Vendor of the Year awards. SHRI HR Entrepreneur Award and Global Recruiters Best Marketing Award. Mm -hmm. One of the top global influencers in HR tech by AIHR, Adrian writes extensively about the future of work on his blog and is the creator of Singapore HR Tech Market Map. He also interviews future of work enablers on his podcast, The Adrian Tan Show. And also joining us today is Rich Baldock, Head of Enterprise Growth, ASEAN and ANZ at Workplace from Facebook Australia. Rich leads the workplace from Facebook enterprise business across Southeast Asia, Australia, and New Zealand. He has been leading teams across Asia Pacific focused on transforming the experience of work for over 20 years. Passionate about digital transformation with people at its core, Rich and his team work with pioneering organizations that share an ambition to make the future of work work for everyone. Originally from the UK, Rich has spent over half of his life living in countries such as Hong Kong, Nepal, Kuwait, India, Germany, Thailand, and he now resides in Australia with his wife and two daughters. Thank you so much for joining us, Nolida, Carmen, Adrian, and Rich. Looking forward to some great insights from you today. And now, without any further delay, let us hear what our speakers have to share with us. I'll begin with the first question that I have. We, we've all been talking about the hybrid work culture, and now it is becoming the norm. So looking at this, what will the future of work look like? And uh, Carmen, I'd like to come to you first for this. Thank you, Yasmin, and um, thank you for the introduction. And I'm very pleased to be here to share my insights. Um, I think everybody knows that the future of work will be hybrid. And it calls into question a few implications around the relationship between leaders and their followers. Um, first of which, obviously, is you know, managing a very remote and distributed workforce. 
And with different countries adopting different um, you know, COVID restrictions, it might mean a start, stop, start, stop, go back to office and you know, go back to home and work from home kind of a relationship. And therefore, because it is expected to continue to be bumpy, therefore, you know, it, it um, requires leaders to really trust their employees, right? To make sure that they deliver to the outcomes and you know, overall they do not uh, um, slow down in terms of their productivity. But at the same time, really, you know, um, it's also a question of you know, how far are leaders going to empower their, their teams and their you know, teammates so that they really let go as well because this is a remote uh, workforce that's going to be managed sometimes virtually because as you can see, you probably will see your leaders you know, through the Zoom most of the time rather than face-to-face. And therefore, the quality and the, uh, you know, the level of interactions will be very different. So we need to really train our leaders to be better at managing uh, this sort of remote, virtual, and distributed workforce. I would say that would be the first insight that I will share. And um, yeah. Thank you. Thank you, Carmen. I think I do agree with you. There's a, the, I think this is something that started has started happening already in the past 18 months. A lot of leaders have stepped up and we've understood how leadership can be done remotely and in a hybrid mode as well. And as you said, it's about experimenting. Start, stop, start, stop. You know, people are experimenting with various modes of how to make it work. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, Norlida, I'd like to come to you now. What does the future of work, I know we can't say exactly what the future would be like, but what do you think it can be like? Thanks, Yasmin, and uh, thank, delighted to be here. It's actually interesting how the future is actually today, isn't it? In the evolving norm and all the start stops that come and reference about. And I, I see the future of work. If you look at the dimension of the traits and capabilities, the, the adaptability and the ability to flex is the first trait that you require. And, and I think this is when you look at not just from internally, because there is an existence to deliver to our customers externally, to the other constituents. So when you look at that, the relationship is just uh, beyond just employer, employee. It's employer, employee, all the stakeholders that come. I like the gardeners, um, you know, where they have talked about the, uh, the human deal. But do you look at your employees now as people and not workers? Because, you know, white work life integration has come about. Empathetic leaders is no longer a requirement, it's a mandate. Because how do you effectively relate to those on the screen, those in person? How do you balance and deliver? And, and really challenging us in that our deliverables are really outcomes and not activities. And I think the future of work in the hybrid will bring a higher escalation on the capabilities and the professionalism. That's my first insight on this one, Yasmin. Thank you. Thank you, Nolida. I think I, I love the point on how organizations or leaders are looking at their people as people and not workers anymore. I think that's very important. The empathy, uh, a lot has been talked about already in the past one year, and it's become a mandate, as you said. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, Adrian, what are your thoughts? Uh, you've been in this space for so long. What are your thoughts on the future of work? What, would, what could it look like, actually? I think specific to what happened over the past one and a half year, definitely a lot of things has changed. Uh, as what Professor Scott Galloway from NYU said, a lot of things doesn't happen in a decade. And then a decade happened in two weeks. <laughs> so when COVID first hit, we were really caught, uh, you know, with our pants down on what to do. Uh, but over time, we managed to persevere. We managed to navigate the situation. And what I think we are seeing right now is, of course, first, uh, firstly, the rush to digitalize because a lot of... Uh, things could not work without the infusion of technology in place. We wouldn't be having this call if we are still required to go off-site to a studio to, to, to film this in person. Uh, and second of all, when it comes to day-to-day -day collaboration, you have your Slack, you have your Teams. Uh, all, all this are uh, slowly creeping into organization for the longest time, but over the past one and a half year, it has truly accelerated. I remember speaking with a local company for the past 20 years, they've been using the same HRMS on-premise solution. Why did they change? Because their people can no longer go into office and they can't take leave. They can't process their claim. And that encouraged them to go into the cloud. And that decision almost uh, took them overnight. So that's one thing. And then second of all, really to... Uh, to the second what Carmen mentioned is uh, the ability to trust. For the longest time, managers, because maybe of how they were led, how they were managed, or maybe coming from an industrial era, uh, many of them are fixated on inputs, the amount of time you place into work, what time you come in, what time you go off, uh, how, how long did you go for lunch. But in today's context, when people are working remotely, there's no way to measure that. Your colleagues, your employees could technically be on their bed watching Netflix. You wouldn't know that. But 
in today's context, it really doesn't matter. End of the day, was the job done? If the job is done, it's okay. Uh, and I think because of that, people will be much more encouraged to be as productive as the Germans would be by making sure that their work are done so that they can just get away from work and go on to do their own thing. And I think that also create a new situation, thirdly, where people will be much more experimental on their side gig and side hobbies. So yeah. more weekend tasks, uh, more evening gigs that they want to pick up because they want to really embrace life. Having seen what has happened over the past one and a half year, the number of deaths that has happened globally, people also have a constant reminder, in fact, a daily reminder that um, the only constant among all of us is death. We're going to die anyway. So if that's the case, why don't we make the best of the situation while we are alive? And I believe this will really stoke a lot of companies to pursue what they see as a tour of duty, as very much captured in one of the books by Reid Hoffman. And that may also convince and uh, make companies more open to having their employees moonlight, as long as the main task is not being compromised. Absolutely. Thanks, Adrian. I think you put up some really great points about firstly, yes, how accelerated digital transformation became a norm, how that happened really fast, you know, happened overnight. In fact, as you said, uh, a decade happened in two weeks, very important. Secondly, the point on putting trust in your people, exactly, you know, you no longer can monitor activities and no longer can monitor productivity. You have to trust them to do their job and look at the outcome. So great points there, I think. Thanks for sharing that. Rich, what would you like to add to that? You've also been working with large organizations everywhere and everyone's moving into the hybrid world what is the future for you now yeah i think um you know first of all i think we need to be mindful when we think about hybrid and ensure that we're not forgetting about what the future of work looks like for over 80 percent of the global workforce who are our frontline employees you know they don't have the luxury of choice when it comes to working from anywhere or in the office and i think organizations need to ensure that the future of work they design really is a future of work that works for everyone. One that is inclusive and can continue to unlock the talent and the insights that our employees on the front line possess. These are the people that are dealing with our customers every single day. And so we've got this opportunity and almost a responsibility to design a future that has arrived you know, much sooner than we thought it would. And companies, I think, need to focus on two sets of questions, where we work and how we work. You know, where we work involves advancing remote work strategies, experimenting with flexible work and keeping offices vibrant whilst keeping a level playing field for those that are on the front line. How we work is about rethinking the experience people have every day and really trying to support the long arc of their careers. And so I think designing a new way of working starts with understanding what work actually is. And, you know, I think it could be broken down into three dimensions daily collaboration, the relationships that we have at work, and the culture that we try to build in our organizations. And once we understand work as more than just getting tasks done, we can focus on how our behaviors, how the technology we use, and how the experiences that we provide support each of those dimensions and help our, community, our communities ultimately thrive. Great, thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Rich. I think it makes a lot of sense that uh, actually we were uh, organizations and leaders were put in the spot last year to kind of redefine work and what work really meant to them, as you said. And then that's how we need to design the future of work based on the kind of, you know, uh, what kind of employees are you looking at? A hybrid workforce? Will it be distributed? Will it be coming to office? And accordingly, you have to create those experiences uniquely for each set of employees that are coming to work for you. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, everyone, I think we did get a sneak peek into what the future could look like. It would be digital. It would mean uh, a mix of, uh, you know, different work arrangements. It could mean working from anywhere. It would also mean a lot of trust in your people and a lot of empathy from leaders as they also have to retrain them themselves to manage a distributed workforce. So thanks for sharing that. Uh, Knowledge, I'd like to come to you again. Uh, while we're talking about the future of work and hybrid is becoming the norm, there are a lot of challenges that come along as well, right? So what do you think would those be and any input on how they can be addressed? Thanks, Yasmin, again. And, and, and you know, I think a fair bit of my esteemed co um, uh, panelists here have addressed, but if we look at it from, and I, maybe I just share a little bit from the uh, Axeta, when I always come back to, to the external stakeholders and customers, and then as well as the employees, how do we continue to, to deliver on that ecosystem, right? 
So, you know, uh, we talk about flexible work arrangement, and I think that's the operating model that we go by. And I think flex space, flex time, flex everything as long as the deliverables are done. So I, for us, that is the Asiata way. But in, in it come that responsibility and accountability, right? The trust that the organization gives to you, we must return by responsibility and accountability because trust is a two-way relationship. And I think that's, that's very key. But in terms of delivering and continuing in the organization with this hybrid work and highly virtual and digital, do our people have the capabilities and then the capacities? So something for us that we're doing is, apart from, of course, embedding it in our, uh, our DNA of being more digital, being more analytical, not everybody has that functional expertise that I'm a data scientist, right? So for us in Axiata under our virtual academy, we just released, but I'm very proud to say our data citizen. So no function should not be able to understand how it works so that everybody builds that capability and you can also improve it. The other capability we want to build is effective communication. It's no longer virtual. You know, we, a lot of us went through communication skills and training, right? Pick up the cues and there. Now, now it's virtual. How many people turn off camera? Do their eyes look down? All those are cues in understanding how effective is virtual that's complemented with physical. So, and, but the other thing that also that we see the challenges is with the invasion of virtual interactions, it causes a lot of strain and mental well being. And this is so much the topic today. And I think all organizations are doing as much as they can in terms of digital uh, uh, health benefits. Uh, digital uh, engagement. So we're quite, we're quite proud to, to put through what we call the Asiata Cares, going on six facets. I know the, 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 the physical, the psychological safety uh, is there, your personal growth, your connectedness to the society. So I think that are, that's the challenges. How do we continue to deliver for the business purpose? How do we continue to operate collectively? And the last thing is that I think leaders, I will, I've just been asked, and I don't mean leaders just by the hierarchy, Yasmin, because leaders today are, are just leading, right? How do we continue to influence uh, each other via these new traits? And I think those are some of the challenges that we have to continue building a diverse and equitable workforce, and how do we make them completely uh, effective and feel very contributing Great. to the organization. Thanks, Noreen. That does make a lot of sense. I think, as you said, that uh, moving into this new norm wasn't really easy, but, uh, you know, you have to upskill. People have to, be, have to become more digitally dexterous, you know, in this time. And then the whole part about trust, again, we come back to the whole point, you're not being able to meet people on a daily way. So how do you have that trust for each other? I think that was important. So uh, thanks for sharing that. I think it makes a lot of sense. And also for leaders uh, here, the challenge to, you know, uh, become more... Uh, people-centric, have that focus again on people more, I think has been brought forward by the pandemic and hopefully it will remain so in the future as well. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, Carmen, I'd like to come to you again uh, on how do you think with this new age of work that we've been discussing today, how will it affect employee engagement and collaboration? Uh, what are your thoughts on that? I think um, with the great resignation as the context, right? I think we know many reasons why people are leaving. And so if we could take a few lessons from there, first of all, people are burnt out. So I would say that, you know, number one, you need to really have, you know, some global approach towards handling burnout and well-being, you know, um, as a key, you know, part of your HR strategy. If you do not look at, you know, well-being and uh, protecting your employee from uh, burnt out, then this is what you get, right? The leakages uh, from the workforce through the great resignation. So that's very key. Um, second thing is every organization workforce has its own, you know, drivers and levers, depending on why people leave, etc. And so, you know, if you want to promote a greater form of collaboration, you know, I, I really think it goes back again to the importance of the company's culture and, and the and the culture and the leadership that it inspires or not, right, will also um, you know, cause your workforce to make some decisions about, you know, um, where they work and who they want to be associated with. I know many young people have, you know, chosen to resign. I also know uh, many uh, who are, you know, in the middle age of their career, they are just living without a job as well for various reasons. But it still goes back again to, you know, um, what sort of demands uh, that the company is putting on me and others' demands unreasonable given such times. 
Are they making me work, right? 16, 18 hours a day with no breaks. And when I want to go on a break, they still call me and whatever. So I think these, you know, are very important considerations. And we also know of companies that are also, you know, forcing employees to go back to work, even though um, working from home, uh, you know, is encouraged, right? So, you know, when companies put their employees' health risks uh, at stake, then employees will also have a second thought about, you know, the, the employer brand that they, they want to be uh, associated with in this very tight labor market that is. Yes, I totally agree. I think, yes, I think flexibility has become such a key component for people now that I think most organizations have said that the internal surveys, 90% plus people have said we would want to have the flexibility to work from home going forward as well. So I think that that is how we need to create the future, right? It has to remain as such. Otherwise, the great resignation will continue to become greater if we do not look at that. So I think thank you so much for Carmen. Rich, what are your thoughts on that? How is How do you think this new work model is impacting employee engagement collaboration yeah I, th I think just um to carmen's point you know facing the great resignation and employee burnout i think there are really kind of three principles that companies need to think about the first i think we have to start with a community first approach you know the future of work isn't about unconstrained individual choice it's about opening up new ways of working that support people teams organizations so companies really need to prioritize the health of their community as they make these decisions and invest in experiences that bring their values to life. Because as we move to this new way of working, we need to find that common thread that brings our people together. And if you think about communities, communities come together over common causes. And I really think that needs to be applied here. It's never been more important for a company to really define their purpose and their values because it's those things that will bring our companies together and align us towards a common goal. The second thing I think we need to think about is social by design. And what I mean by that is how do we support meaningful relationships when people aren't working in the same place? And that really includes making it easy for people to discover and build relationships virtually. I think the office experience actually in the future will really become the place where companies focus on helping people expand their networks and deepen their relationships versus places where work gets done. The third element to look at, I think, is impact from anywhere. And what I mean by that is, you know, as we look toward a future where some people choose the office, others opt to be remote, and we have a large number of frontline employees, we really need to make sure that the playing field stays level and that every person can fully and meaningfully participate regardless of where they are. And that really requires every team to have the tools and the processes that ensure that everybody can be seen, heard, and access the information they need to do their job. Great, thanks. Thanks for sharing that, Rich. I think uh, in the end, it's all about being inclusive, I think, to all kinds of employees that work for you. How do you make those arrangements for them? How do you create flexibility? And I love the point on build, try helping, enabling them to build meaningful relationships with each other. I think that's really going to, you know, make sure how, the, what kind of an employee experience you're creating overall for your employees. So thanks for sharing that. Adrian, is there anything you'd like to add to that as to how, you know, engagement and uh, employee experience collaboration is kind of, getting reimagined in this new world of work? Uh, I think we, uh, we have obviously been seeing a lot of uh, things being done in terms of engagement. I mean, uh, Quadrix has been around for the longest time. We look at all the different other companies, Engage Rocket, trying to take a spin to it. Uh, but I think what we will be seeing right now and progressively more is to personalize that experience. Because for the longest time, when it comes to learning, when it comes to engagement, it's always a one-size-fits-all. I will come up with this survey questions. I'll send it to everyone, 300 of us in the, in the company and expect everyone to go through the same thing, just like your training, just like every, every other thing. But if you think about it, um, personalization is really the key if you want to engage people, just like there's no one size fit all uh, or how, uh, you know, the, uh, even, even companies like hotels, they will have the premium for the, the luxurious clientele and we'll have the budget for people who are just hitchhiking. So we have to take that step as well. But of course, then the next question is, scaling it is going to be tough. Does it mean that instead of me sending out one email to 300 people, I need to create 300 emails for 300 people? Uh, that, of course, is where technology again comes into play. I know an Australian company called PIN, P-Y-N, that is really tackling this problem. And they're able to scale all these personalized messages uh, and at the same time, putting a, time, a very accurate timestamp unique to the individual. So the day you join a company to the day you're having a birthday or anniversary, so on and so forth, the system can automatically alert you. 
of what's going on and of course try to get you to take some action. So I think really taking a very marketing approach as what marketing department has been doing for the longest time when they try to target different segments out there. And, and the other thing, uh, of course, is really unique to uh, the generational sentiment because the way you deal with a boomer is very different from the way you deal with a Gen Y, Gen Z, millennial, whatever you're, you're calling them right now. And the, their wants and needs are very, very different. Some of them may prefer that you uh, interact with them face-to-face, -face, some of them through email, through messages. And again, you have to localize the same message across different platforms in order to drive maximum engagement. So I think these are things that for the longest time, when it comes to the administrator or from a HR perspective, you would just type out email, send, okay, I've done my job, that's it. But in today's context, that cannot be the same. You, you have to really take a more tailored approach. And again, I think technology can play a big part to help you scale that approach so that you can still achieve the same aim with very little effort, but really personalization at scale. I do agree. I do agree, Adrian. I think hyper-personalization is very important. And I'll come back to you and Rich again to ask a question about what kind of tools and technologies can, you know, uh, enable this kind of a change. But uh, before that, a non-edine comment, being HR lead I have leaders, I have a specific question for you. How can HR leaders take a people-centric approach? How can they identify the unique needs of the employees? I think it's very important. You have to listen, you have to feel, right? So how do you do that, Nolidan? Would you take it up first? So with me, uh, you know, once we knew that the pandemic was going to be forever, right, because we never know where the ending is, you really have to look at your EVP in, in the simplest word and, and understand. So what we've looked at, we've looked at our people life cycle and at every touch point from attraction to development uh, to, to growth and even when they're going to go, right, because uh, it's a fluid uh, working environment here and really balancing which is digital and virtual, which is human. And I think this is very much what Adrian said. You've really got to see your, your, your population base. And then sometimes you have to experiment. So what we've done is, I think as HR leaders, as we look back at our people, uh, people strategy, and one of the critical uh, enablers that we have used is actually asking the people that leaders outside of HR to play that role. Because uh, with a lot of digitalization and virtual, more of the human contact is going to come through their people managers. And that's why I talked earlier about enabling that skill sets of their engagement. So I think from, from an HR perspective as a leader, I, I, I look at putting in a, a, a strategy. And I think just also, I'm very, very keen about how, you know, engagement surveys are popular, right? But I'm really calling out to understand the engagement index with the well being index. Because I then think that, you know, you are having a, a very balanced approach. And um, in, in Azeta, we have this thing called MAD culture, modern, agile, and digital. So, you know, to mobilize this, we also have to give them that capabilities, right? So I think as, a, as an HR strategy is giving people the capability to engage professionally and personally. And I think especially um, the younger generations, they want a very fulfilled fulfilling experience that touch the purpose, not just the world outcomes. So yes. I think that's where, for me as a leader, I, I look to do that. I think that's a great thought. Thanks for sharing that knowledge. I think, yes, as you said, again, uh, to Adrian's point, to your point, there are different generations, different kinds of employees. You have to, you know, listen to them, you know, understand their needs uh, and they're unique. And then you have to kind of personalize those. And I love your point about the mad culture. I think that's that's very interesting. I think people can really take a clue from that, a cue from that. So thanks for sharing. Carmen, how about you? What are your thoughts on how can HR leaders have a people-centric approach and understand the needs of their employees? I think um, traditionally, you know, you put out that employee survey and then you collate the results and then you put in place some actions. I think more and more we know that people analytics is very key. So the ability of the HR function to really use data, not just people data, but business data that sits in some part of the organization, right? And being able to connect the dots and uh, put together some um, diagnostics around what is the numbers, you know, telling you from a story perspective about the workforce, right? And what your employees are not telling you directly, right? I think it's, it's the skill of the HR leader that needs to do that because then you will be able to deliver, I, I believe, a more impactful um, approach to your human resource strategy. And uh, we, we've seen many companies do that, right? 
Um, I would say that, you know, in uh, HDX, we have a lot of data and uh, being, you know, the science and tech agency, we are very careful about how we curate the experience uh, for our employees. So not just being high tech, but high touch as well. So when we, you know, were able to go out, right, and, uh, you know, talk to our frontline employees, our CEO uh, went to, you know, at least 10 locations to make sure that he was seen, he was, uh, you know, able to relate to the frontline uh, employees because, you know, it's hard for them to feel connected to the organization. Um, and, and just when many other companies are having challenges in hiring female tech talent, we don't have that challenge because the mission and purpose of HDX is to secure Singapore as the safest place on earth. I mean, what could be more lofty than that for a Singaporean? And so we managed to have many you know, female engineers apply and we give them very impactful experience and they are able to innovate. And when we have tech forums, they are actually sharing with us the technology, you know, innovations and to brief the board members. I mean, for a young graduate, right, who's worked barely three years, I think that gives them nothing but a high, right, yeah. from a career perspective and the level of impact. So I think, you know, for, for me, I think these are the nuances and, you know, the, the ideas that we've had to create a more human, because, you know, then that female engineer is not just somebody who is, you know, in the workforce statistic. Yes. But I yes. know her name, right? She's Cheryl, she's, you know, Karen. And uh, she's able to relate to us why, you know, she wants to continue to stay in HDX when many tech companies are hiring in Singapore. And in Singapore alone, we know that there are at least 500 fintech companies. Yes. I yes. hope that helps. Great. Thanks. Thanks for sharing that example, Carmen. Very inspiring, actually. And yes, uh, as you said, it's uh, we need to understand data better. We need to understand analytics better to understand what our people, uh, what are their needs. And then, you know, create those experiences for them based on that high tech as well as high touch. Very important. So thank you for sharing that. Uh, I'll come to you now, Rich, again. Uh, a lot of the technology has been the catalyst for everything that has happened in the past 18 months. So tell us about some new tools and technologies that will enable the success of the hybrid or the remote working model that we are now experiencing. Yeah, thank you. Well, I mean, I could give a really biased answer uh, given where I work, but I won't. Um, you know, the first thing I think, you know, we need to look at is, you know, some of the data that we're seeing that's quite concerning. You know, we all know that product productivity levels have remained fairly consistent over the last 12 to 18 months, but, you know, it's definitely come at the expense of people's well-being. Uh, you know, some research that I've seen from Microsoft suggests that nearly a third of all employees in the region are feeling burnt out, with Singapore actually topping the list at 37%. And, you know, that's caused by uh, stress because of a lack of separation, a, a, a lack of separation between work and home life, and, you know, some feelings of isolation. And it's no surprise when the data shows that the length of the workday has increased by 45% in Australia, 37% in Singapore, 17% you know, in Japan. But I think what's really clear is that the proliferation of real-time communication tools, such as email, video conferencing, messaging, chat, you know, it's a major contributing factor. We've all got VC fatigue. We all have notification anxiety. And it's really, really difficult to switch off. So I think in the near term, if we're really going to embrace hybrid, you know, which implies greater flexibility of working hours, and continue to engage our employees on the front line, we've really got to move to this more of an asynchronous way of working. You know, there's nothing worse than coming back to a group chat or even worse, company-wide chat after being away from your device for a few hours, let alone if you've taken some time off, you lose all the context, you lose the ability to be part of the conversation. And these tools just don't scale effectively for, for company-wide conversations and engagement. And they certainly don't build inclusive communities. So I think, you know, with hybrid and these new ways of working, in some sense, giving people the ability to work the way that they want to work, we really need to ensure that we're bringing inclusiveness into the tools and technologies that we adopt and roll out into our organizations. We really need to give everyone the space to contribute and share their voice. And it, I think if we fail to do this, then we really risk not getting the diverse perspectives of the entire workforce and innovation will be at stake. So companies will need to invest in technology that provides the flexibility required to engage remote in office and frontline employees. Now, mid to longer term, 
I think it's going to be about solving the challenge of how can we deliver presence, even though that we're apart. So I think the adoption of virtual reality and augmented reality technology will definitely be the future of collaboration, bringing people into a virtual space. And, you know, ultimately it's closer than we may think uh, we may think it is. Hey, thank you. Thank you so much, Rich. I think, yes, uh, again, the whole point is that these tools and technologies are required, but how thoughtful are you when you're choosing those kind of tools and technologies for employees is going to be important because adoption is one thing. You don't want to stress them out furthermore, burnout. Everybody, you know, Lida, Carmen, Adrian, Rich, all of you have spoken about how mental well-being has also become so, so important in these times, especially since the pandemic struck. So tools and technologies have to help us sort it better rather than adding to the stress. So, so thanks for sharing that. Adrian, what are your thoughts? What, what, is, what is it that you're seeing the technology space that can help enable a better hybrid model? Um, I, I think there are really a lot of different tools out there that definitely can help. But I think we also have to take a step back to uh, not really put too many things on our plate. Yeah. Uh, and the, the thing about hybrid to begin with, of course, is uh, the the blur, blurry line that we have right now between work and life. And most of the time, and I, I mean, I think we, we have seen uh, how it was many years back when emails first came into the scene. Oh, it's going to remove the tons of time that we spent on fax machine. Look where we are today. I woke up to 200 emails in my inbox this yeah. morning. I cannot imagine me on any given day where I'll receive 200 pages of fax. So uh, technology sometimes doesn't really help. It actually amplifies the situation because it's so easy to put things out there, just like how TikTok uh, turned so many people into content creator overnight. Uh, so the key thing for us, especially for knowledge worker, is really to take a step back and to really understand what's so important about it. What are important, what are urgent, and what are things that you can delegate out. Yeah. So you have to start looking at yourself as a person you are managing. You're managing a team of one. And that means whatever is important, yes, I'll work on it. Whatever isn't so important, can I delegate them? So yeah. those are key things you have to look at first. And of course, where technology can come in is really to help you automate away a lot of uh, monotonous stuff, things that are very repetitive in nature. So you have RPA, you have chatbots, uh, you also have AI that could help you to answer certain queries, uh, especially for very small HR departments when they're dealing with a large team of people, especially across different regions. So these are things that um, technology can play a part in. At a personal level, of course, there are also things that you can do for any knowledge worker, even outside of HR. Like for myself, I actually install application to help me uh, summarize uh, content so that I can repurpose them or even look at ways I could do to, for example, uh, reduce, reduce uh, anti-noise cancellation when I do Zoom meetings and all that. So all this can actually be found in many different applications out there today, uh, how, to, how to do uh, automated follow-up. So these are things that I think any modern day knowledge worker has to spend time on so that they could still continue to knock, down on, knock off on time and go back to their family uh, despite what is going on right now. Absolutely, totally. That, um, that's a great thought. Thanks. I think in the end, it, uh, technology has to help make work work better for us, as Richard all, uh, was also said in the beginning. You know, work, work has to become better for us. We have to learn how to manage things better and get rid of the million jobs that, you know, are not required to be done and focus on the core, you know, valuable job and the meaningful purpose that we are here at a workplace for. So thanks for sharing that. On that, on that note, the, that was uh, the end for this discussion. But I have one question. I'll ask each one of our speakers to give me one word that you think will define the future of employee experience? Just one word. It could be agile, it could be flexible, it could be meaningful. So just one word and knowledge, I'll come to you first. I'm putting you in the spot here. So one word that you think can, you know, would be the future for employee experience. Authenticity. Lovely. I love that word. Authenticity. Carmen, what about you? Creative. Creative. Lovely. Thank you. Adrian, how about you? For me, it'd be personalization. Lovely. And Rich, what about you? Care. Care, oh, beautiful. So on that note, I think since we're talking about the new era of employee experience, our speakers have said it loud and clear. It has to be authentic. It has to be caring. It has to be uh, creative and it has to be personalized. I think that kind of sums up our entire discussion today. So thank you so much for your time today, Nolida, Carmen, Adrian, and Rich. It was a wonderful discussion. It was so great, so much to learn from you on how organizations are focusing so hard on creating the right employee experience and how, as you said, authenticity, creativity, being caring and personalization will pave the way for successful organizations. So on that note, thank you so much, everyone, for joining us. We have a networking break coming up after this session, so make the most out of it, and I'll see you on the other side. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you.